There was no food, very little ammunition left, very little fuel left. The Germans vowed to destroy them by all means. We were the most bombed place on Earth at the time. There were air raids, you know, one after the other, no respite. Night, day, the Luftwaffe were relentless in their attacks. The majority sees it as a reminder of the great ordeal that our forefathers had gone through during the Second World War to preserve for us the freedom that we have today. What is it that drives people to be brave? To commit acts of heroism, often in the face of the enemy. I'm Darren Coventry, former soldier and now video and podcast producer at BFBS. I've been talking to men and women who've received the UK's highest military honours. We talk about what happened, what they thought at the time, and how they feel about it now. This is Tea and Medals. This time, something a bit different. During World War II, the Mediterranean island of Malta was awarded the George Cross. It's 80 years since that happened. So we went there to find out why an entire island received one of Britain's top gallantry medals. So we're here at uh, the Lascaris War Rooms and we're here to talk about uh, the George Cross. Malta was awarded the George Cross as a nation. Uh, first, um, I'm here with Mario. Mario, could you tell us uh, who you are and what you do? Well, my name is Mario Farugia and I'm the chairman of the Malta Heritage Trust, which in Maltese is Fondazione Wirtartna. And we're responsible for a host of um, former British military um, heritage sites, one of which, of course, is the war rooms here. And we've come here because in the Second World War, 80, almost 80 years ago, Malta was awarded the George Cross, but let's kind of take it back a little bit from there and um, tell me why was, why was Malta so strategically important um, during the, the, the early stages of the Second World War? Well, Malta's importance stems from the fact that from 1800 onwards, which is the, the year when Malta uh, became a British uh, colony, you know, it wasn't a colony really in, in, uh, in the real terms, but you know, Let's, let's call it a colony. Uh, Malta became a very important naval base. It, it was home to the Royal Navy Mediterranean Fleet, which was the largest squadron of the Royal Navy. And uh, from here, Britain could control not just the Mediterranean, but more importantly, um, the Middle East. In fact, they kept a very large naval presence in Malta all the way up to the Second World War and especially in the 1930s when there was fear of rising Japanese expansionism, that in case of need, rather than leaving uh, parts of the fleet in Singapore, where they would be within reach of the first wave of um, Japanese um, attack, they would be kept in Malta, and from Malta, they, they would be sent to the Far East. And they could quickly get there through the Suez canal and Ab absolutely, absolutely. well you have to keep in mind that the Suez canal was also in British hands yeah and you also had Alexandria which was another important British naval uh, base and they had dockyards there as well so uh, you know Alexandria Malta and Gibraltar yeah um, you know the Mediterranean wasn't was, was in British hands so you got Gibraltar at the, at the entrance to the Mediterranean yeah, in the west and yes. Malta in the middle and Alexandria yeah, yeah, in, in yeah. the east and it's also interesting to mention that Malta was 1,000 miles away from Gibraltar in the west and 1,000 miles away uh, from Alexandria in the east. So that's why Malta was so important to be kept. And that's why Winston Churchill, who really and truly, besides being um, a war leader, was also very much into naval affairs, knew very well that if Malta fell, then, you know, Next would be Gibraltar and Alexandria. And not far north, we have Italy. Yes. And then, obviously, to the south, we have North Africa, all, mm -hmm. all of which would come into play yes. in... Uh, which was Italian. Uh, yeah, sorry, and, and North Africa was Italian-controlled yes. at the time. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and as war broke out, it broke out uh, yes. all across the, yeah. the north of Africa as well. Absolutely. One has to um, um, take into account 
the fact that in 1939, the map of Europe was essentially covered by dictatorships. Very few countries, including Britain, were democracies. And um, essentially, you know, Germany, the communists in, so in the Soviet Union, um, the fascists in Italy, then you had the um, phalangist or proto-fascist dictatorship in, in Spain, and uh, you had a similar dictatorship in Portugal, although it was milder. Um, all of these were bound at, uh, in, in, in a sort of alliance um, against, against communism. So no one really knew what was going to happen. So of course Britain, in particular, had a very good reason to be fearful of the prospects of Malta at that time. Also because Italy had the Italian fascist dictator Benito Mussolini had you know, over and over again stated that he would wanted to turn the Mediterranean into an Italian lake. And Malta in the middle was the stumbling block. So when the war came, you know, where the first uh, overseas territory, outside Italy that is, to be bombarded by the Italians. And so in the outbreak of war, the Italians yes. led the, um, the, the air, the air yes, attack. Yes, yeah. so not, not the first air. Italian act of war was against Malta. And that, I guess Early that, in the morning on the 11th of June 1940. And that then started what became known as the, the, the siege of Malta, I suppose. But yes, I guess the it Blitz. Took a, um, but then again, the Blitz, you know, we had four Blitzes. We had the first Italian Blitz, which started running into serious problems. Then the Germans came in, um, in late 1940. They came to Sicily and in early 1941, they unleashed, you know, an attack on Malta, which lasted months. And then when um, Germany was to invade uh, Russia, some of these forces were um, transferred to the Eastern Front. And they had left the campaign, the air campaign over Malta in Italian hands. And once again, you know, the Italian offensive started well, but after a while, you know, started failing. And then the Germans came again. So we had four periods which are, historically speaking, or referred to as blitzes. Okay, so they are minor blitz within the main blitz. So you introduced us uh, to uh, Judge Joseph Gallet de Bonin, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, we, we met with a judge yesterday who talked to us about the air defence. So yes. maybe we can have a bit of a look at that. Former judge Joseph de Bono is president of the George Cross Island Association and told me all about the battle to control Malta skies. Now aircraft would normally be approaching from the northeast yeah. or the north, but they could even come from the northwest. I mean, they were coming out, uh, out here from all angles yeah. to surprise the defence, you see? And maybe just trying to combine the, with the listening stations and the... Yes, the listening and the, station, uh, and the, the radar. Lights, the, radar. the radar gave advance notice. As soon as they took off from Sicily, they would know that they were coming. Now, uh, here, you have a typical layout in Malta of what an AA battery of the heavy type used to look at. Mm -hmm. This would be the command post. It's half underground. Mm -hmm. These would be the predictor and the rangefinder enclosure. Anyway, so you see, this is almost the highest point in Malta here. It was definitely the highest gun battery on all, all over the island. Now, this was not hit. And this is where the lieutenant, Major Rajus, was sleeping that night because he had taken over the duties from another captain subaltern who wanted to wake up very early in the morning and he said, would you do the early stint from 4 a.m. onwards for me because I take, I'll take some rest because I have to leave early. And he accepted. So he left his room in the officer's mess and came here to do the 4 a.m. watch. And he dozed off a bit as well. At some point, one of the sergeants came along and said, why, wow, that was close, that was close, because some bombs had rained very close by. Then somebody said, sir, I think something happened to the mess, the officer's mess room, where they were sleeping. When he got there, they found a hole in the roof, which was a corrugated roof. Then they looked at the bed where he was supposed to be sleeping that night. And again, there appeared to be a hole in the bedding. And on taking up the mattress, 
they see this bomb ticking away under the bed. So the sergeant said, he froze and said, let's get out of here, let's get out of here. After some time, the bomb went off. It blew up the mess, the officer's mess. And had it not been for that officer asking him to do a favor not to sleep in that bed that night, he would for sure have been split into two with the bomb that fell right on his bed. So we know what the air battle was like. It was mm -hmm. fierce. As we know now, Malta was bombed more than any other place in the world, mm -hmm. and more, much more so than the Blitz of, of London. Mm -hmm. um, what were the conditions like here, um, not just in Valletta, but I guess Valletta mm -hmm. would have been one of the centres of yes. population. What were the conditions like for the people? Well, the conditions were awful. Um, you know, Malta lived for almost three years under a constant siege, meaning you know, the island was completely cut off from the rest of the world. Anything had to be brought in by ship at enormous costs. Because, you know, we, we tend to um, remember the uh, role of the Royal Navy and the other fighting forces, but very little at times is said about the very important, vital role of the merchant marine. Um, hundreds, if not thousands, were either lost at sea or injured, trying to keep Malta supplied. The issue was one of the thorniest of the whole campaign. And, and I guess, you know, for, for people who have never experienced that or can even imagine it, you know, we're talking about lack of food. But Medicines. People, food and medicines. Clothing. Um, a lot of men would have been involved in the defence of the island. Yes. So, so the women were having to do uh, those manual jobs that mm -hmm. the men had had mm -hmm. to vacate. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't as much as in the UK. I mean, you know, the Second World War was probably the first instance where women were, you know, came out from the house for the first time in history to undertake some of the male jobs. But it wasn't on such a large scale as it was in the continent or, or, or in the UK. You know, um, the Maltese women still very much carried on with its pre-war role. Very few, actually, women um, had involved themselves directly in, in the defence of the island, except the ones who were involved in um, area precautions. Some others were serving with the British Red Cross, um, um, and also as uh, voluntary aid detachments, which were nurses. Um, but, you know, as you had said, um, all, all, the, all the men of a certain age were involved in the defence of the island. And we heard a story from um, Kim Daly, who's the um, researcher and author and, uh, I guess, filmmaker. And she's a filmmaker, who, yeah. Who's um, creating uh, a series about the women mm -hmm. of war. Mm -hmm. And she told us a story in particular about a lady who, who would have worked here. Yes, um, Christina Ratcliffe. Yeah, so let's hear about Christina. <laughs> Christina Ratcliffe was a beautiful woman from the UK who travelled to Malta um, in order to perform as a cabaret artiste in one of the clubs, in one of the bars right off Stray Street here in Valletta. And then suddenly war struck and she found herself trapped in Malta um, and the bars, you know, closed down. So she joined um, a number of other artists um, and artists here in Malta who were also mainly from the UK and they formed a troupe called the Whizbanks and they would tour um, Malta, you know, performing to the troops and really helping in raising morale. However, Christina went even further in her war efforts. She joined to become a plotter at Lascaris War Rooms, which was the you know, nerve centre of, of the war, the war HQ here in Valletta. And her job was to be fed information from the filter room through her headphones. And she would plot using the coordinates, the enemy's movement, as well as the allies' movement. And that information was absolutely critical for the you know, decision makers to take a decision on where to attack, where to defend, and to really see how to disperse you know, um, their troops and their movements. So she was actually promoted to captain of her watch. She was also decorated with a medal for her efforts. She received a BEM in Christina. It meant a lot to her 
she was very thankful to have been recognised. Unfortunately, what I have found that many of the women actually that I do explore were recognised at the time, but they have just fallen through the sands of time. No one remembers them any longer. No one. Their names have just disappeared. And that's what we're trying to reverse, is we're trying to bring them back to the public for to be recognised um, and to be remembered again in Malta and beyond. Kim Daly who's making a documentary about how the women of Malta responded to the siege. The conditions were extremely dire. Malta was essentially on the brink of starvation. Women sometimes bore the brunt of it. So remember, um, the first persons who were fed were obviously the military personnel and the soldiers, right? And as you trickle down through the hierarchy, the less sort of resources were spared for them. And Maltese women in Malta, we tended to have large families with many, many children. So many people I spoke of remember fondly their mothers and grandmothers, how they would often go without food to feed all the hungry children. The bombing was incredible. This is something that one has to... I was quite intrigued by it because apart from the hunger, also the, the, the sheer exhaustion, they weren't sleeping. We were the most bombed place on earth at the time. So there were air raids, you know, one after the other, no respite, night, day, you know, the Luftwaffe were relentless in their attacks. So people were essentially living an underground existence. There are shelters beneath the entire country with women, you know, handling these massive blocks of, of, of rock, you know, and actively helping the men in, in digging the shelters, which was so crucial. That's how people survived at the time. So my next question, why do you think the people of Malta were so resolute against the invasion by the, by the Axis forces? Well, I think I have a very um, simple answer to that. You know, they had absolutely nowhere to go. So they had absolutely no options other than to fight on, you know? There was no issue, no issue of any of them leaving the island. So obviously they had, to put up, they had to put up with it. And when you have bombs raining on you, you have to do something about it, unless you want to die. So um, it is true, the Maltese were loyal to the British crown. Um, they never uh, faltered in, uh, in, in uh, doing their bit. But, you know, in simple terms, the Maltese were caught on this island, which was completely surrounded by naval and their forces pummeled on a daily basis and um, you know what would you do if you would be uh, in, in such a position it was a hopeless position but still they were stoic and um, you know they prevailed against all odds along with the defenders yeah because I guess one, there were lots of lots of forces yes there were 40 40,000 men defended Malta including many Maltese RAF um, RAF Navy, Navy and, 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 and their force infantry. Yes. Let's hear another story from uh, Judge Joe. We're looking across the harbour to Kalkara Bay, where the family of my father-in-law used to live before the war. When the bombing started in June 1940, and of course this was a target area, they decided to go into the hinterland in Mosta, which is in the center of the island, uh, because they thought the, it would be safer there, as refugees, of course. And they were living there throughout the, the, the siege. But in uh, March 1942, a convoy had just arrived in the island. It was a tragic convoy, really, because of the four ships, none actually survived. However, two did manage to get into the harbour and the Germans vowed to destroy them by all means. And that there was a shower of bombs on the three days it took before the ships had to be scuttled because of the fear of an explosion, of a terrible explosion from the ammunition in, in the ships. So three days before, in Mosta, two bombs fell at the two entrances of a public shelter. And with the blast, something like 36 people died men, women, children and babies. So my wife's grandmother said, what is the point of staying in Mosta if it's going to be bombed as much as our old home in Kalkara? Let's go back. And so they moved back to Kalkara. That was just three days before. They moved into their house here. 
And on the 24th of March, 1942, they were in the shelter during an air raid anyway. They were in the shelter practically all day because it was a 24 hour raid. And this basement shelter uh, took her, Mary Coster, my wife is main, named after her, their mother, that was the grandmother, her sister, and a few cousins and kids were all grouped there in this basement shelter. A bomb fell on the house. It severed the gas main servicing the Beagie Hospital, which we can see across the water here. It severed the water main pipe, which is serving the hospital as well. And gas started seeping down into this basement shelter. Of course, it overcame them. They became drowsy, then they passed out, they fainted. But the water from the pipe, the water mains pipe, started seeping into the shelter. And finally, they were all drowned in the rising water in the shelter. Two of his brothers, who were working in the hospital, heard that this thing had happened in that street. They didn't know whether their house had it, but they quickly ran down from the hospital to the house to find out. They found that the, whole, the house was in ruins completely, and one of them ventured down into the basement, and he never came up again. The second brother, Augustus, went down into the shelter, and he never came up again. A cousin, who was also with them when they came down from the hospital, went down into the basement and again never came up again. And the only survivor of that tragedy was uh, my father-in-law. So in two world wars, my father-in-law lost his father on HMS Russell in 1916 and the rest of his family in March 1942 in their house in Kalkara. And I think that's a really, um, one story that shows just the conditions here yes, in Malta dur during that time. After that date, the father became a very quiet man. He wouldn't talk about it. And there was a calendar in their home when I used to frequent their house as a, the fiance of his daughter. And uh, there was this calendar showing 24 3. And I always wondered why it was always 20. Once I asked, I said, why? And they came out with the story that that was a day when, when he lost his family. His whole family. And he wouldn't allow anybody to change. Um, I guess my question then is, is you know, what was life like day to day for the people in Valletta, maybe? Well, um, life, daily life in Valletta and the other towns, that surround the harbour, which we call the inner harbour area, obviously differed from the life in the countryside, yeah. where the larger part of the population was living at the time. It wasn't like that before the war. Before the war, most of the population lived huddled around the harbour, because that's where work was. But obviously, when the um, aerial bombardment started, there was a whole migration away from the target areas to the countryside. So those living in the countryside um, had to walk long distances every day um, to, um, to their work, to their place of work. Some others would take the bus, but buses were not running the full, um, the normal routes as in peacetime. So obviously one had to walk a long distance to catch a bus, then the bus would stop um, at Floriana, and then you had to walk the rest if you were going to Valletta or if you were crossing um, to the three cities uh, using the, the, the ferry, for example. Um, obviously, the, the main concern for everyone was not that of dodging bombs, okay? If you speak to anyone who actually lived in those years, like my grandparents, for example, and I remember vividly that they used to mention it almost on a daily basis, um, you know, the concern of finding food, yeah, okay. because that, there was no because supplies. Because there was, yeah, there was no food. So that was the main concern for everyone. And then next came, of course, clothing and, and, and other um, necessities for, for, for daily life. But the main concern had been food. Okay, and the Maltese um, are brought up to love their food. 
So uh, it, was, it, was, it was a difficult thing in those days, you know? Um, but then again, even for example, if you were, if you were a child, um, you know, education was interrupted. There were some efforts for, um, for schooling to restart in, um, you know, in different places, not in proper schools. Schools were taken up by the military in most cases. In, in many instances, for example, schools were, were used as, as um, small hospitals as well, or, or um, first aid posts or, or whatnot, you know? Transportation was next to um, non-existent, you know? Whoever had a car was not allowed to, to, to drive it because there was no fuel, yeah. you know? So everything, everything changed. I mean, you know, life, as one knew it in, uh, in peacetime, uh, before the war, had changed completely. Uh, people kept um, moving houses, for example. Um, another thing is, uh, you know, disease. Many people uh, started getting sick as a result of not sleeping proper, properly, not eating enough vitamins, you know, not... not um, um, things, th uh, things and like no that. basic medicines just and to no, treat and those no, basic medicines. Absolutely, yes. It was very, very difficult. And one has to share, one, one has to say that, you know, the same hardship was shared, and they always underline it, by the defenders. Okay? They were under the, the same siege. Under the same siege. You know, it was not an issue of the military eating, having more to eat than, than the locals. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't the case, especially in 1942. And, and I guess 1942 gets us to a, a particular moment in history, and mm -hmm. you might need to get me straight here. Um, the Operation Pedestal was mm -hmm. the, the first or the, the biggest convoy that, it was the biggest, yes. that, that broke the siege mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. Malta and delivered supplies. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess there'd been other stuff up to that point, but yes. lots of ships had been lost. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Tell me about Operation Pedestal. Well, Operation Pedestal was the largest um, British convoy ever organised in history. It had the largest naval defence set up that has ever been, probably not even in the uh, Falkland War. It was such an undertaking. Winston Churchill wanted that convoy to get through because he knew that if it didn't, Malta was going to fall. And that was it. You know, that was going to be it. Because there was, the supplies had got to such a stage where there was nothing left, you know. So it was very, very important for Operation Pedestal to get through. And it had only gotten through by a whisker because both the Germans and the Italians knew about the importance of that particular convoy. And they had unleashed against it all their forces, starting from the North African coast, I mean, you know, French occupied territories. Because they um, would have been Vichy occupied yes, territories yeah, by then. Yeah. They started attacking the, the ships as soon as they got through Gibraltar. And um, they were attacked by uh, aircraft, torpedo bombers, Italian e-boats, the fleet, submarines, you name it, you know. And most of the ships were actually sunk. It was only four ships that actually made it. And one of them was the all-important SS Ohio. It was an American fast oil tanker, which was burrowed by Churchill, specifically asking for one such tanker, because he knew it was, that it was going to be very difficult. Um, he actually asked the President of the United States for one such tanker. And um, apparently it was on loan. You know, they didn't get it afterwards because it was reduced to one big rack. The tanker was hit several times. On one instance, um, a German aircraft crash landed onto it. Really? It broke in, in two pieces and um, it was abandoned four times. You know, it was one of those ordeals. But at one point, two naval vessels accosted it and they lashed it round in order to keep it afloat. And that's how it entered the Grand Harbour. Hmm. And Malta was saved. And that's a, a lot of effort and a lot of uh, lives must have been lost in uh, yes. getting that through. Yes, yes. Casualties were enormous. But the significance of that operation was crucial, you know, was of 
immense strategic importance. And you should know that in here we've got the red duster of one of the ships. So the real reason we've come to talk to you was about the fact that uh, Malta have been awarded the George Cross. And mm. uh, we've heard why. The people of Malta yes. um, went through a lot. Malta was key to the, you know, uh, the, the defence and the mm -hmm. security in this region. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us about um, the decision made by King George at the time. Well, I think it was unique. I think the decision to um, award uh, you know, such an important bravery um, um, award to an entire nation and its defenders, I think it was a first in history. The king took the initiative, which was very unusual really. He started mulling over the idea of some kind of award to uh, recognize the effort which was being made here, both by the garrison, British and Maltese, and by the local civilian population, which were bearing the brunt of it. And at one point, he came up with the idea of creating a new medal for civilians to correspond to the Victoria Cross, which was meant for uh, bravery on the battlefield in action. And he thought it would be a fitting thing to do to award it to the country, not to individuals. He took a bit of note paper bearing the Buckingham Palace logo and proceeded to write in his own handwriting a holograph note to the governor of Malta. So I guess uh, the king made a very unusual decision a personal decision, mm -hmm. and he decided he didn't consult with the government, um, and that was the very first time that it ever been awarded to a, a collection of people, mm -hmm. um, and it's mm -hmm. gone on to be awarded mm -hmm. to two other collections, which one with the Royal Ulster Constabulary mm -hmm. in Northern Ireland, and mm -hmm. one to the NHS in Britain. In Britain, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, normally, George Crosses are awarded for individual acts of heroism, yes. um, not in the face of the enemy, and uh, we can see that a lot of Malta, a lot of people of Malta mm -hmm. had displayed those, yes. those acts. Well, personally, I think um, King George VI was a people's king in many, many ways, probably prodded by his wife, who was very aware um, of the importance of affiliating with the, with, the, uh, with the common people in particular, probably as a result of the abdication of his brother, Edward, uh, Edward VIII. So we're almost done, but I think I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the George Cross Association on the island have um, their own commemoration. They, mm -hmm. they built the siege bell. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And again, Judge De Bono took us and gave us a tour of that, so we can hear all about it. The George Cross Island Association wanted a physical reminder of Malta's wartime struggle. They commissioned the Siege Bell Memorial, which overlooks Valletta's Grand Harbour. Joseph De Bono took me to see it. And that this must be the best views in the south of Valletta, yeah. It's uh, it is spectacular. A very dramatic view. It very evokes so many, many memories. And here we see the siege yes, bell. the siege bell. Now, the siege bell was put up by the George Cross Island Association way back in the early 1990s. And it was inaugurated by Her Majesty the Queen and the President of Malta, Dr. Vincent Tabone, who was my former in this position as chairman and as honored president of the uh, George Cross Island Association. Who during the war was uh, an army officer, medical officer, stationed in nearby Fort St. Elmo here. So he had every interest in seeing that this association would grow. And every year when the reunion takes place in April and our friends from the UK come over, members of the association for this reunion, we gather here and have a commemoration and a religious service, and then the bell tolls at 11 o'clock. It's a very evocative experience, I can assure you. The bell is a 10-ton bell cast in Britain, and uh, the design is uh, made of gozo stone, and uh, it is now one of the established features of the Grand Harbour entrance. 
And besides the actual bell, next to it there is the catafalque, which represents uh, a sailor being buried at sea just before the actual burial takes place. And that is to remember the sacrifice of the Royal Navy and Merchant Navy people who lost their lives bringing out supplies to Malta and during the siege. And I guess there's one question, which is a side question I have uh, before I say thank you, is the George Cross made it onto the flag of Malta. Can you tell us about, about, <laughs> maybe not now. No, no, no. I, uh, uh, tell, actually, us, look, tell us about the... When you go to the Malta Tour Museum, make sure that you will see the pennant. There's a pennant which comes from the governor's staff car. That is the first flag ever to show the George Cross on the Maltese colours. And that was a deliberate decision taken by Governor Gort. Because on that occasion, he was going to award the George Cross to the nation. You know, and then the idea was taken on board by everyone and the George Cross ended on our flag. So, do you, so was the initial decision just to put it onto the car? Yes. And then it became... And I heard the story from the daughter of the ADC, of his ADC who actually donated the, the pennant to, to our museum. So Governor Gort was the governor of the island at yes. the time, and he... Um, who was the one who actually brought the George yeah, Cross. Yeah, so he, he had the George Cross to, to reward, and I, yes. I guess that, I've seen the photos. He, he, came, he came in April, um, but they didn't do a, a proper um, public ceremony at the time, because there was the war on, mm -hmm. so they did it in September. And, th and that's when the George Cross appeared on his pennant? Yes. And then someone thought, yes, that's, a, after, good, that's after a good that, idea. Yes, after that, yeah. And it appeared on the flag. Yes. And uh, now it's, at, we've noticed the Maltese but it, flag. But it, it, it was done, of course, you know, through the official. Yeah, yeah. You know? uh, the Maltese flag is everywhere. Yes. So how do the people feel about the George Cross on the flag? Hmm. From time to time, there's a debate that surfaces in Malta whether we should keep the George Cross on our flag or not. A very tiny, minuscule um, element points at the George Cross and claims that it is a remnant um, or an imposition by our former colonial masters. But the majority don't see it that way. The majority sees it as a reminder of the great ordeal that our forefathers had gone through during the Second World War to preserve for us the freedom that we have today. Okay? That is it. And each time that this debate comes up, you know, it ends up into nothing after one or two days. Mm. You know, why? Because there is a very strong bond with our flag, but also the George Cross, because the George Cross reminds us of those very, very difficult times when our forefathers, many of whom were young, you know, young people, had given up their youth to ensure that us today live the comfortable life and free life that we live today. Mario, thank you very much for having us. And, and thanks to Malta. We've seen the whole island. <laughs> we've, we've met lots of people and yeah. everyone has amazing stories to tell. So thank you. Thank you. The award of the George Cross was made by King George VI in a handwritten letter to the island's governor. It reads, To honour her brave people, I award the George Cross to the island fortress of Malta, to bear witness to her heroism and devotion that will long be famous in history. <laughs>